Good morning. My name is Pastor Bob, and I welcome you here today at the Faith Community Church. Thanks for coming. If you're new here, at the Information Center, there's a little welcome pack there. Uh, there's a nice coffee mug in there, and if you've never gotten one before, you can help yourself to that. There's a friendship register at the end of the chairs here. If you would take that and fill in your name, fill in any prayer requests you may have, uh, we love praying for you. We have a membership class coming on next week, and so if you're not a member, we'd love for you to, to uh, check out that class and come out for the membership class, but you need to sign up. You can do that at the Information Center. Um, February 4th is our annual business meeting. It's a potluck, and right after that potluck, we're going to meet back in here, and we're going to share, I guess we'll meet back in here, correct? And we're going to, each uh, department is going to share um, how the past year has gone. So you're all welcome from that, and there's further information in the bulletin. Next week, are you listening? Yes. Okay. We have a corporate prayer time next week, Sunday night at 630. We do these corporate prayer times like three, four, five times a year. And this next Sunday is going to be specifically praying for those people who don't know the Lord. So we're going to be praying for the ministry, like for the children's ministry. We're going to be praying for the VBS, that kids will come to know the Lord. We're going to be praying for the youth ministry. They're, they have this basketball camp coming up, and there's going to be a lot of unsafe people coming up, and we want to pray, pray for them. For the adults, even for Easter, we're going to start praying for them. And it's personal. I want uh, plan A to go up, Peter, if you can put that up here. The other one, plan A. Okay, plan A for telling other people about Christ. Believers are to go as you are going to share Christ and make disciples. The only way that people are going to know about Christ is plan A, if we tell other people about Christ. So, there is no plan B. <laughs> there is no plan B. There is no plan B, meaning this. God is not going to write across the skies. This is how you accept Christ. Plan A is for us to tell other people about Christ. We, there's no plan B. I looked, read through the whole Bible. There's no plan B. There's only a plan A. Now go to the next slide here. Your greatest achievement in life is this. Your greatest achievement in life is when you tell someone about Jesus Christ and God uses you by the power of the Holy Spirit for them to accept Christ. Now listen, to this. if someone accepts Christ, their life is forever changed on earth. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Your life is totally changed on earth. If you tell someone about Christ, their life is totally changed on earth. But not only that, listen, look, listen to this. If someone accepts Christ, their life is forever changed on earth, and then for all eternity, all right, they get to enjoy life for all eternity. So millions of years from now, this person that you shared Christ with, they're going to come up to you and say, hey, remember when you shared Christ with me one million years ago, uh, 600 days, da, 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 da. Thank you for that. A billion years from now, they're going to say, hey, thank you. You bump into them again. They're going to say, hey, thank you for sharing Christ with me. So let me ask you this. Can you think of a greater achievement in life than telling someone about Christ? There is no greater achievement, and it all starts with prayer. So next Sunday, come out, Sunday, July 28th. <laughs> I did that on purpose, just to see if you were listening. January 28th at 6.30. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Pastor Bob. All right. Friends, if you're able, if you'll stand, and we're going to sing a little bit. I was buried beneath my 
church, sing about how good our Lord is. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days, I'm in held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up, until I lay my head. 
so good to us Father God that that truth that you are good to us is is so awesome for us to be able as a collective body as a collective group of believers to be able to declare how good you are to us And Father, no matter what situations or trials us as, us as individuals are walking through, no matter if we're, um, if we're in the middle um, of a rough situation, Lord, we can confidently say that you are good to us. And so God, let us be a church that proclaims your goodness at all times and in all ways. And Father, we love you and we give you all the praise and all the honor here in this place. So your son's saying that we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, you can be seated and take a look up at the screen. They said it's like taking Tylenol, but immediately I felt both pain and regret. I realized I might have made a mistake. My decision was supposed to make me feel relieved, like nothing had ever happened and I could just move on. I was told this choice wouldn't negatively affect me, but I feel so guilty and alone. Every day in our community, she is influenced by cultural lies about who she is. She is crushed by the false promise that her life would be better. Her fear is crippling, and she can't imagine a world outside her current circumstances. She feels hopeless, but we offer hope. We speak truth to her with love and compassion. We share with her how valuable she is, that she is God's masterpiece, and so is her baby. We offer life-affirming choices. We talk about hope and her future. And generations are changed because she came here first. You can partner with us. You can make a difference. You can save a life. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I guess y'all can tell this is Sanctity of Life Sunday because here I am again. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Jean Coelho, and I'm not only a member here at Faith Community, but I have been blessed to be the office manager at Lifeline Coalition for the past couple of years. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak just a few minutes this morning. Um, and being Sanctity of Life Sunday, this is our fill the bottles with change, or checks, or dollars, or both, or all, uh, for the next few weeks. But I also want to praise the Lord for this church that stands on the word of God, that believes and preaches that life begins at conception. Amen. So, let me start with what God has done in the past year. Through our marketing strategies, we have reached 801 women. The majority, the majority of those are looking for an abortion. Because of God's faithfulness, we opened a second clinic in Winnebago County and began seeing patients in June. We have had 480 appointments we have been able to provide 468 ultrasounds. Now, each woman that comes in who, re who gets a positive pregnancy test gets to meet her baby via ultrasound that very day. Lives saved in 2023, 140. 
And since we opened the first medical clinic in Freeport back in 2020, 700 Gospels of John have been handed out. That's the word of God in the hands of 700 women. Accepted and taken. And you know that his word goes out, it doesn't come back void. So we pray for each one of those that eternal lives will be changed. So we praise his holy name for that. I began volunteering back in um, 2020 when we were still known as the Freeport Pregnancy Center. I started with answering the telephones and scheduling appointments. And then I volunteered as a receptionist while I still answered the telephones. So I've heard a lot of stories and I see, I've seen a lot of women who come through the doors. The mission statement of Lifeline Coalition is that we exist as a Christ-centered ministry to effectively serve the at-risk pregnant woman and empower her to choose life for her unborn child. So, what does that look like? We give the woman a chance to breathe. The enemy wants her to panic, wants her to rush. Don't think about it. This has to be taken care of today. Just move forward. You can't do this. Let's just get this done. But at Lifeline, she can breathe. And God presented this beautiful story to me just this past week. I had the privilege of sitting at the reception desk at our Loves Park location on Wednesday, and a gal came in who was visibly exhausted and nervous and literally antsy, if that's even the right word. Um, I welcomed her by standing up and introducing myself as I do as the receptionists do. Hi, I'm Jean. How can I help you? Um, and then I asked her to complete the registration process. She was so anxious, you guys, she couldn't even sit down in the chair to fill out the information. She just paced in, in the reception area. When she had finished, our nurse greeted her with calm and loving compassion. After they had their consultation and she met her baby on that big screen in the ultrasound room, the nurse brought her back out to the reception desk. I asked her to complete our exit survey, um, just what we call it, just a few questions on how did their appointment go, how did they even learn about us, is there anything that we can change or improve, just a few questions. <clears throat> This woman stood in front of me at the counter and she took a breath and she mouthed the words. She visibly breathed and said, thank you. Satan wanted her mind to be in panic. He wants chaos. Because when our mind is in panic mode, it doesn't work correctly. We don't think clearly. We can't be rational. But she was breathing. She could think clearly. She could make a rational decision. So, how can you guys help this happen? Please pray. I wish I could convey the feeling, although I'm sure many of you know, when you just know that you're being prayed for, <laughs> that's what our prayer team does. Maybe it could be just a quick, Lord, be with them today, or maybe you could give it a, a full-on prayer closet experience to pray for us. I'll never turn down any prayer. Come see me after the service out at that half circle, the old welcome center, and, and we'll get you hooked up on our, our text. We send a, a daily text update on the appointments and how you can specifically pray for some of the girls. Volunteer. We've got volunteer opportunities with the helpline, taking the phone calls, uh, making appointments, answering texts. Uh, don't worry, there's lots of training, but if the Lord's pricking your heart, let me know. Maybe a receptionist. Uh, we have morning and afternoon shifts. It's not an all-day thing. Um, in Freeport and in Loves Park, if you couldn't commit to a consistent one day a week, maybe you could just be a sub. 
like when one of our moms has a sick child or somebody wants to take a vacation. I can't believe they do that. Um, one of the big things right now is an interpreter. Uh, we have a lot of Spanish-speaking gals of late. Um, I'm sure you can imagine with um, the influx of immigrants. Um, we have two right now, but one of them moved to Texas, and I have not been able to convince Maribel's husband to bring her back. So um, we have one here and one in Texas. We do her through Zoom, you know, thank goodness for technology, uh, but we really could use an interpreter here in Freeport and in Loves Park. So if you can speak Spanish, or if you know someone, please put them in touch with us. That would be such a blessing. And uh, because I make sure that the electric bill is paid, I think you know that I'm gonna ask you for your support. Honestly, we could not do any of the things that we do without your financial support, you guys. God working through the hearts and the checkbooks of his people makes all things possible. The average cost to open the clinic for a day is $150. The average cost to save a life, what I shared last year, is $100. The cost to reach one woman through our advertising campaigns, through that little Google click that she's searching for an abortion, when our name comes up, is $30. It costs us $7 to provide prenatal vitamins. We can't pay for advertising. We can't pay for Google clicks. We can't turn on the lights or the ultrasound machine or have heat or have the amazing, compassionate, loving, caring staff without your partnership. Last year, I asked you how many babies you'd like to save. This year, let me just change it up a little bit. At $150 a day, how many days could you help us open the door? $100 a life, how many babies would you like to save? With a cost of $30 for every Google click, how many women could you help us make contact with? One a month? Two? Seven? Seven dollars for that bottle of vitamins. How many healthy moms and babies would you like to help us with? 15? And as I said, this being Sanctity of, Life, of Human Life Sunday, we begin our baby bottle campaign. So I invite you to stop out at the half circle out there and grab a baby bottle, take it home, fill it up, bring it back on February 18th. You guys, I can tell you firsthand that oftentimes the deciding factor for these girls to make an appointment with us is because we provide all of these, all of the services at no charge. We don't benefit financially or anyway for whatever decision they make, but it's because it's at no charge. That's the love of Jesus Christ because of you. Thank you. And friends, if you're able, would you stand? And we're going to pray over this ministry and together as a body. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jean and for, and, for the, um, and for all the people that work at Lifeline. Lord, we thank you that you have equipped them and you have put them um, in place to serve and to love women um, in a really powerful way. But Lord, we acknowledge that this is hard and that the enemy wants to attack this. Um, and so, Lord, we ask you to protect them, to equip them, um, and to give them words to say when they don't have words, and to say when they um, encourage them on hard days, um, and let them rejoice on good days. Lord, Father, we love you, and we thank you for this ministry. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see you all here as you traverse the frozen tundra. 
My name is Nathan. Uh, I am one of the elders here at Faith Community Church, and I would like to start out today by telling a story. I'm a storyteller. Uh, well, I like to think I am. A story about how I got here, and not a story of like, whoa, what is the meaning of life? How did we get here? Not like that. More like, how did I get here on this stage again? So Pastor Bob approached me uh, through text and asked if I would preach today, being one of the days that he's on the Nepal trip, right? This was uh, two weeks ago, which relatively is last minute. Last minute. Usually when I'm scheduled or asked to fill in, it's months in advance. So two weeks, he might as well have just asked me yesterday. I mean, come on. So I gave him my usual response, which I'm sure you've all heard before, which is, yeah, okay, I'll do it. To which I then asked, what series will we be in? And he gave me an answer that I dread to hear. You can speak on anything. A little bit about me. In school especially, getting to choose my own topics was the worst. The worst. Anything. I can speak on anything. Do you know how many anythings there are? How am I supposed to narrow it down? But I'm not in school anymore. I'm a grown-up. I mean, I'm an adult. I can figure this out. I can narrow it. Come on, Nathan, you can narrow this down. So this is my process. Old Testament, New Testament. (laughs) Old, Old Testament, of course. Prophets, historical, poetry. Come on, history. Let's go. Moses as the main author, or Moses as not the main author? Uh, Let's go with not the main author. Not that I'm against Moses. I just don't like teaching his stuff. And then, from there, I meticulously broke it down and found out what I wanted to teach. Is what I would like to say is what happened. That's not what happened at all. This is what actually happened. (laughs) Pastor Bob asked me, do you know what you're speaking on? And I said, not yet. And he said, why don't you do something in Judges? And I said, bingo. And then he said, Samson, that's too long of a story. Jephthah, no way. (laughs) Gideon, perfect. There you go. So that brings us back to now. This morning, we are going to go to a small character study on the man Gideon. And I titled this sermon, Me? You want to use me? Are you sure? Now, if you're thinking, what kind of title is that? Uh, I'm right there with you. So let's open up our Bibles to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. Now, I'm going to go through a little bit of context of what Judges is all about. Here's a little bit of history leading up into Judges. Moses brings Israel out of Egypt. They don't go into the land because 10 of the 12 spies that went into the land were scared. So um, they turned the people against Moses, and then they had to wander the wilderness for 40 years. And then Moses dies. Joshua, Moses is kind of like... uh, Student, you know, the guy under him. Uh, he goes in, conquers most of the land, and distributes it, distributes it among the tribes. Then Joshua dies, and then this is where the period of the judges start. Now, this period of the judges is interesting because there's no king. There's no king in Israel. The author of Judges says that all the time. And this, at this time, there was no king in Israel. It lasted over 400 years And the events all follow the same four-step cycle. The four-step cycle. I'm sure you've heard this before. Israel does evil in the sight of the Lord. God allows a foreign nation to come in and conquer and oppress them. The people cry out to God for deliverance. God sends a judge to deliver them. And if you want to add a fifth step, that's okay. It's repeat once that judge dies. A circle. 400 years of this this cycle. Over and over and over again. My professor in college uh, described it more of a spiral. A spiral. A downward spiral. Okay, so it's still going in a circle, but it's going downwards. The, The events of Judges themselves start out very good, but then with each passing generation, it gets worse and worse 
And worse, all the way ending with civil war. Civil war. And the kidnapping and forced marriages of 400 women. It's a terrible ending. So, yeah, terrible. Gideon's story is kind of right in the middle. Right here. So, let's start reading in chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 1. Then the sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Stage one, or phase one. Did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hands of Midian seven years. Stage two. The power of Midian prevailed against Israel because of, because of Midian, the sons of Israel made for themselves the dens which were in the mountains and the caves and the, and the strongholds. For it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up with the Amalekites and the sons of the east to go against them. So they would camp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel as well as no sheep, ox, or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents and they would come and like locusts for number. Both they and their camels were innumerable. And they came into the land to devastate it. So Israel was brought very low because of Midian, and the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. So there you go. There's the first three stages. People are sinning. Midian comes in, oppresses them, steals all their stuff. People cry out. Okay? That's the stage. It's been set. Now it's time for our player to come in, like like in a play, an actor. Enter our player. And here is where our character study can begin. Now, I gave Gideon a title. I gave him the title of A Human Example Indeed. Gideon, A Human Example Indeed. Just like Jesus called Nathaniel an Israelite indeed, after Nathaniel scoffed about the Messiah coming from Nazareth. Everybody remember that that story from John? What good could come out of Nazareth? I gave Gideon that same kind of title. A Human example, Example Indeed. Because many of his actions he takes and the thoughts that he has are common with us as imperfect human beings. Imperfect mankind. So let's see how many of these actions Gideon takes. Uh, Which ones would we do? If you would like, you can put a little star next to him. And then we'll trade papers and we can all judge each other. That'll be great. No, I'm just kidding. We won't do that. All right, let's skip down to verse 11. So the uh, Amorites, the Amalekites, they're all, the Midianites, they're taking over the land. Verse 11, then the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak that was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the, oh goodness, Abbey's right, as his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press in order to save it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Then Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. All right, let's stop there. The angel of the Lord comes to Gideon and tells him, The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you, Gideon. And here's Gideon's first action, first response. Gideon is bitter. Bitter towards God because of his circumstances. Why has this happened to us? Where are your miracles? The Lord has abandoned us. The first thing out of Gideon's mouth in this story is a complaint. Oh, the Lord is with me? Then how come I have to beat this wheat in a wine press? Oh, yeah, it's because I have to hide it from the Midianites who are oppressing us, who are stealing all of our produce. That's why, angel. So what would be our first reaction when our circumstances aren't ideal or even worse than ideal? Would our reaction be similar if we were going through something hard and a stranger said, hello, friend, the Lord's with you. God is with you. Would we we be gracious or would we be a little bitter too? 
I reckon maybe many of us would behave like Gideon. Was God with me in that meeting where I lost the job that I love so much? Was God with me in that doctor's office when I got that diagnosis? God's miracles didn't stop my family member from passing. My child has walked away from Jesus. God has abandoned our family. Those are very similar reactions that we might have. So maybe this will be more relatable than we think. Let's go to verse 14. The Lord looked at him and said, Go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? He said to him, O Lord, how should I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least of Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. But the Lord but the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat Midian as one man. So here we go. Number two, God gives Gideon a call, and Gideon makes excuses. Gideon makes excuses. <laughs> my family is the least of the tribe of Manasseh, and I personally am the least of my father's house. That's pretty low on the totem pole of Manasseh. That sounds like an excuse, Gideon, and it is. But Gideon's kind of in, I don't want to say in good company, because you don't want to say, yeah, you're in good company if you're complaining. But even Moses and Jeremiah, the prophet, reacted similarly. Exodus 3.11, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? He's saying, I can't do that. Later he says, he's slow of tongue, he can't talk well. Jeremiah 1, 5 through 6. This is God talking first. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I, Jeremiah, said, Alas, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak because I am a youth. That sounds like an excuse too, Jeremiah. Jeremiah. So how often are we the same way? God calls us, and we have our reason for not obeying. I would venture a guess that it's, it's fairly often. Uh, it's not good timing right now. I barely know that person. I can't tell them about Jesus. I don't know the Bible well enough to do this. Crowds make me nervous. My tummy hurts. Something else, someone else has to be better than this than me. Those all sound like excuses. And maybe those are some that you've used. But even with those excuses, Gideon, Moses, Jeremiah, God reassures them in each passage that he will not abandon them. God will be with them. And three times God makes the promise to Gideon. In verse 12, in verse 14, in verse 16. The Lord is with you. Have I not sent you? Don't worry, I will be with you. Three times he promises. Now go to verse 17. So Gideon said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from here until I come back to you and bring out my offering and lay it before you. And he said, I will remain until you return. Then Gideon went in and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread from an ephah of flour. He put it, the meat in a basket and the broth in a pot and brought them out to him under the oak and presented them. The angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread. And fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. Then the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Third thing Gideon does. He asks for a sign. Why did he ask for a sign? So that he can know that it is you. That it is God. He, let, let me verify this, God. Let me verify that it is you that is talking to me and not some prankster from the city downtown or down the road. Or a lying spirit to try to trick me into doing something I shouldn't. (laughs) 
Now, the Bible does say don't put your Lord God to the test, but I do see something here in God's character that's pretty amazing. He is patient. He's patient with Gideon all the way. By this time in the story, this is not good. I'm kind of putting myself in God's shoes. I would have already moved on to someone else. Hey, Gideon, the Lord is with you. Where you been at, God? Oh, okay. Gideon, I'm sending you to go do something. But I'm not that great at it, God. Okay. Gideon, don't worry about it. I will be with you. Hey, God, show me a sign that it's you. Okay. Hey, uh, Greg, you want to go save Israel? You got it, man. That's what I would have done. I would have moved on. But lucky for Gideon and for Israel, I'm not God in that he does have patience. And many of you know the story, you know how it ends, so yeah. Skip to verse 25. Skip down to verse 25. How are we doing with our uh, check marks? Anybody marking any down? Verse 25. Now on the same night, the Lord said to him, take your father's bull and a second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal, which belongs to your father, and cut down the Asherah that it is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of the stronghold in an orderly manner, and take a second bowl and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah, which you shall cut down. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had spoken to him. And because he was afraid to, or because he was too afraid of his father's household and the men of the city to do it by day, he did it. By night. So number four of Gideon's actions. God commands. Gideon obeys timidly. He obeys, but he does it timidly. He does it by night. God says, hey, tear down those altars. Or tear down those, those idols. I am the one true God. Your father's house should not be worshiping these idols. So Gideon's like, yeah, I'll do it. But I'm scared. I want to do it away from people. I want to do it at night so no one sees me do it. Now, does Gideon have cause to be afraid? Yeah. I mean, if you read on, the townspeople prove that by the things that they say. Who was tearing these things down? Let's get them. Let's kill them. Oh, it was Gideon. Let's, let's put him to death. But who else would Gideon be afraid of in this situation? Not only the townspeople, but who else? His own family. These idols were his dad's, his father's household. Gideon's family had idols to Baal and to Asherah. Gideon definitely obeyed, but by doing so, he was going against his own family. Now, for us, is it possible that living for Jesus may go against our own families? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. Who said that? Jesus said that. Jesus wasn't lying. I mean, he wouldn't lie anyway, but... There may be a possibility that obeying Jesus will go against your family. So this is a positive for Gideon. He did do it. He did obey. But he didn't do it in mighty power. He did it kind of on the sly. All right, let's go to verse 33. Skip down to verse 33. Then all the Midianites and all the Amalekites and the sons of the east assembled themselves, and they crossed over and camped in the valley of Jezreel. So the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet. And the Abizarites were called together to follow him. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh, and they also were called together to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they came up to meet them. Then Gideon said to God, If you will deliver Israel through me, and you have spoken, behold, I will put a fleece of wool on a threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only, and it is dry ground 
or dry it all on the ground, then I will know that you will deliver Israel through me as you have spoken. And it was so. When he, er- wrote, when he arose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he drained the dew from the fleece and the bowl of, into a bowl of water. Then Gideon said to God, Do not let your anger burn against me, that I may speak once more. Please let me make a test once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece, and let there be dew on all of the ground. God did so that night, for it was dry only on the fleece, and dew was all on the ground. So the fifth thing. Gideon tests God again. He asked for a sign again. Now the first one, hey God, let this fleece be wet and the ground dry. Uh, that probably would have happened in normal circumstances. I feel like the dew would have dried up off the ground a lot faster than on the fleece. So that one was just kind of like, oh, well, whoops, maybe I should have done it the other way. So we, that's kind of how I think Gideon thinks. Maybe not, maybe so, who knows. So the second time, let's, let, let's make the fleece be dry and the ground be wet. This one's more of a miracle. And does it happen? Absolutely. And interesting again that God is understanding of his doubt. He's understanding of his doubt here. He does not rebuke Gideon at all. You would think he would be like, Gideon, come on, man. This is the second time you're going to try to test me. Third time, I guess, if you count two of the fleeces. You should know that I'm the Lord your God. I've been talking to you. Everything's been going the way I've been saying. You've been obeying me. This is great. Why are you, not do- Why are you still testing me? But he doesn't. God understands doubts, that we have doubts sometimes. How many of us doubt certain aspects of the Bible, certain aspects of our faith? How many times do we stumble and we are stuck on the ground? Many times, but don't worry. God is understanding. God will keep on being with you through those doubts. He has proven it with Gideon, and he'll prove it with us too. All right, let's move on. Chapter 7. Don't worry, we only got four more chapters left. That's a joke. I'm just kidding. All right, verse 1. Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, they gave him that nickname back when he tore down the, uh, the Baal statue. And all of the people who were with him rose early and camped beside the spring of Herod. And the camp of Midian was on the north side of them by the hill of Moray in the valley. Then the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give Midian into their hands. For Israel would become boastful, saying, My own power has delivered me. Now therefore, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is afraid and trembling, let him return and depart from Mount Gilead. So 22,000 people returned, but 10,000 remained. Then the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Therefore it shall be that he who, of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, he shall go with you. But everyone who, of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, You shall separate everyone who laps the water with his tongue like, as, a, as a dog laps, as well as everyone who kneels to drink. Now the number of those who laughed, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people kneeled to drink water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, I will deliver you with 300 men who lapped and will give the Midianites into your hands. So let all the other people go, each man to his house. So 300 men took the people's provisions and their trumpets into their hands. And Gideon sent all the other men of Israel, each to his tent, but retained the 300 men, and the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. That story is familiar, right? We all know that. I don't want to get into all the why God chose the lapping over. It's it's a numbers game. It's a numbers game. Gideon rallies this army. Midian's forces is like locusts. They cover the ground. There's so many of them. So naturally... A man of war would be like, there's a lot of people out there. 
we need a lot of people to fight a lot of people. Makes sense. So the best way to fight that army is with another army. And God says, no. No, we're not going to do it that way. I want there to be no doubt that this victory is mine. If I let this happen, Israel will just be like, yeah, we're the best army ever. It was all of us. We all did it together. Hurrah. That's not what God wants. God wants to make sure this victory is going to be mine. And I want people to know that this victory is mine. Gideon was relying on the physical, an army, people. Now, is it just me? Or do we often rely on physical things in our lives more than we rely on God? Do we first go to our families when we need help? Do we first go to our friends? Do we go to our doctors? Do we go to our government? Do we go to our money to fix our problems? Those are all physical things. They're things we can see, things we can, well, kind of, things we can touch. Not that relying on one of these things is necessarily bad, but those should not be chosen before our own Lord. We should rely on God first because God can save us from anything, with anything. So Gideon relies on armies instead of God. Gideon relies on armies instead of God. What do you rely on instead of God sometimes? Hopefully it's not, hopefully it's not often. But what are the things that you rely on that's not God? It's something to think about. All right, let's go to verse 9. Oh, last one, please. There we go. So he spoke also to the men of Penuel, saying, oh, wait, no, that's not right. Sorry, I got to find out my, my passage here. There it is. Now, the same night it came about that the Lord said to him, Gideon, arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hands. But if you are afraid, go down, or if you are afraid to go down, go with uh, Pura, your servant, down by the camp. And you will, lay, you will hear what they say, and afterward your hands will be strengthened that you may go down against the camp. But he went with Pura, his servant, down to the outposts of the army that was in the camp. All right, so there we go. God promises another thing. Hey, I'm going to give this camp into your hands, Gideon. Go down there. But if you're afraid still, you can take your servant with you. So God promises Gideon still fears. How do I know that? Well, he took his friend with him. He took his servant with him. After all the signs, after all the promises, all of the commands, Gideon is still fearful. God commands him to scout out this enemy camp, which in reality is a scary thing to ask. Hey, Gideon, just you. Go down to your army, this army, this enemy of, that you were going to fight against. Just you. But God, again, who is passionate, who is understanding, says, if you are afraid, you can take your servant with you. And Gideon does. He is obviously afraid. Are you, see, are you seeing a pattern here? Who is the hero of this story? Is it Gideon? No, he's the main character, you could argue. But he's definitely not the hero. God's the hero. God has shown himself faithful. He has shown himself powerful. He has shown himself passionate. God is the hero. Now, verse 12. Now, the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the sons of the east were lying in the valley, as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number, as numerous as the sand of the seashore. When Gideon came, behold, a man was relating a dream to his friend, and he said, Behold, I had a dream. A loaf of barley bread was tumbling into the camp of Midian, and it came to the tent and struck it, so it fell. And turned it upside down so that it, the tent lay flat. And his friend replied, This is nothing less than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given Midian and all the camp into his hand. When Gideon heard this account, of the, the account of the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, 
For the Lord has given the camp of Midian into your hands. He divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put trumpets and empty pitchers into their hands of, into the hands of all of them, and torches inside the pitchers. He said to them, look at me, and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. And when I do, or, and when I and all who are with me blow the trumpet, when then you also blow the trumpets all around the camp and say, for the Lord and for Gideon. So, that's the plan. I'm going to summarize the ending for you. Uh, it goes the plan, perfectly. The Midianites freak out a little bit. They start fighting each other. This battle is won. God throws the enemy into confusion, and everything works out. And here is the last action of Gideon's that is so natural. Gideon takes credit for what God did. Gideon takes credit for what God did. God has been moving and encouraging and proving he is the one to save Israel. And Gideon instructs his 300 to shout out the Lord's name, but also his name. The guy who has been fearful this whole time. The guy who has been testing God. It reminds me of school. This is just a school sermon, I guess. Remember in school when you had a partner and you had a project to do and you did all the work. And then on the last day, your partner's like, hey, throw my name on there, please. And you're like, well, fine. And you just do it. That's this situation, but worse. God did all of the work. God said, I'm going to prove this by saying 300 men are going to defeat this entire army. And Gideon's like, yeah, good job, God, and me too. I did good too. We'll get into that a little bit about our own lives later, but how often do we do the similar things? So let's go to some applications. Some applications. Gideon is far from an ideal hero. In fact, uh, he was right about himself at the beginning. I'm kind of lowly. I'm the, the lowest of my family, of my tribe. He wasn't wrong. But here's the first thing. God can take weak and broken people and do mighty things through them. When we are at our weakest, God will prove to be the strongest. And that is amazing. John 3.30, this is John the Baptist speaking. He must increase, but I must decrease. That is John talking about Jesus. And John wasn't a weak guy. He must increase, and, but I must decrease. So let's use, let's look at an example here. Let's look at me as the example. Me, right here. With my, oh, okay, response to teaching this morning, I was not in the right heart. Just be honest. My attitude was saying, it's pretty short notice, and how am I supposed to narrow down this topic? I'm not wired that way. I don't like it. That is not the right attitude. What I should have been saying was, I'm out of my comfort zone here, God. But use this clay pot to show yourself mighty. Oh, and thanks for thrusting this topic right in my face. And then to prove it, I threw a fleece outside and said, hey, make this hot by morning. I didn't say that. It would have been going a little too far. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfect, perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with results. It distresses, with, <clears throat> with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So do we have 
faith like Gideon. Now, why do you say that? Gideon had faith? It doesn't sound like it. Well, according to Hebrews, he did. Let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter, verses 32 to 34. What more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, all judges, of David and Samuel and the prophets, by whom faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. But we just read this story. Gideon was not a faith-filled guy. But he was obedient. And if we even put just the faith that Gideon did, God can still use us in a mighty way too. Even with our flaws, our failings, our brokenness, our weakness. But how true is it also that Christians, especially, take credit for what God is doing in us? How often are we thanking God for the power he is giving us, for the work that he is doing through us? If we are successful in our work, are we like, hey, thanks, God. I couldn't have done it without you. Or are we like, that was me. I did it. I worked hard for this promotion. I worked hard for this whatever. Maybe it's your marriage. Your marriage is going really, really well. You're both loving each other. You're both happy. Are you saying you worked hard at it? Well, marriage is hard work, for sure. But are you taking credit for something that God is doing? Maybe it's a thriving ministry, a personal one or a bigger one. Your ministry is thriving. People are getting saved. Are you taking pride in that? Or are you giving that pride up? To God saying, you've done all this work. Unfortunately, that's what it is. It's our pride. Our pride takes over sometimes. And we do not give the glory to God for when we succeed. So let's realize how broken we are and live humbly so Jesus can be glorified in the work he is doing through us. Second of the applications. Before we can be used, we have to tear down our idols. This is a small part of this passage, but Gideon was called to deliver Israel from Midian, correct? Yes. But what was the first command that he was given by God? Get rid of your family's idols. Get rid of them. If we want to be used by God, we cannot have things that trump God. We cannot be worshiping something that is not him first. Remove it. Burn it. Whether it's a person, a hobby, an item, money itself, whatever it is. If we are loving something other than God, more than God, remove it. Maybe that's why we're not being used. It's because we live in a time, a culture, a system that loves stuff, loves streaming services, loves sports, loves whatever. You can name a whole bunch of things. And then we wonder, why aren't we being used? Why am I not being used? Oh, it's because I love this thing more. Get rid of it. Remove it. Burn it. We may be weak and misshapen vessels but we must be clean vessels to be used. we got to love the Lord first. And here's my final thought in closing. Final thought. If we are followers of Jesus, we will be called to do something. We're gonna, you're going to be called to do something. I don't know what it is. It's going to be different for everybody. And sometimes that call, many times that call, may seem out of our skill level, out of our experience level, out of our knowledge level, or our age range, or whatever. We will be tempted to be, to be disobedient of that calling. And if we do disobey because we think, oh, I can't be used for this whatever reason, what are we actually saying? What are we actually saying? 
Are we saying my abilities aren't good enough to be used? They're not enough. My abilities are not enough. Is that what we're saying? Or are we really saying God's ability to use me is not enough? Think about it. Let's pray. Lord God, you are, you are quite amazing. You are wonderful. You do things that we do not understand. You use weak, broken people to do wonderful things. And it's a mystery to many of us. It's a mystery to me, but we thank you that you do because otherwise we would never be used. So Lord, help us to get out of that attitude of, I can't be used for whatever reason. Help us to get out of that because we know that you have the ability to use us, even in our brokenness, even in our weakness. We can be made strong through you. And we can be made strong because of Jesus and what he did for us. So Lord, Help us to be like Gideon, but also not like Gideon. Help us to obey, but also to give you the credit right away. Because we can't do anything on our own. So Lord, help us to change our attitudes if we need it in this area. And it's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Friends, you're able to stand as we close today. Can I? 
cannot stand, I fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Father God, we need you. And Father, it's, it's clear for all of us here in this room and all of us watching online that we can't do truly anything without you and without your power working through us. And so, Father, we ask that as we go from here and we go from this place, that you work in us, that you equip us to do um, wonderful things in your name. And know, Father, we love you and we give you all the praise. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. amen. Church, have a wonderful day in the Lord.